And welcome back, spooky people, to another episode of That Spooky Life with your host here, Miranda. Hope you guys are doing well today. I actually have a couple of funny stories to kick you off with, uh, one of which is paranormal, one of which is not. So as I sat down to record today, I actually went through and recorded all of this, and I recorded the listener story and the afterword and everything I had planned to do today, and I went back to start editing and listening to it, and the sound quality was completely terrible, which was strange considering not three weeks ago I bought a brand spanking new microphone that was upgrading that sound quality really well. Turned it over to find out like the back USB part was bent so that it was almost at a right angle rather than being a straight line. The microphone itself didn't look damaged, so I was like, okay, well let's try trading out cords. Well, that did nothing. It still sounded terrible. Which means that at some point this microphone has been damaged, and I know that I haven't dropped it and I can't figure out how it happened, but here we are recording on the phone again. So I'm going to try and make this the best quality that I can for you guys for these few episodes. I'm trying to record a little bit ahead of time to get ahead of the holidays, uh, but I have already ordered another microphone and we will be back to your expected quality ASAP, I promise. Today, the personal experience story that I want to share with you guys is prefaced by something that has been going on in my life recently. I believe I mentioned that some of my experiences of late have been different audio experiences, as it were, which is new for me and off-putting. But it's not that it's never happened before, it's just not common. I have also, to my knowledge, never actually mistaken a dead person for a living person. If I pass by somebody on the street and I'm not thinking about it and they weren't actually there, I would never know. You might say that we passed two people on the street and I would say three, but unless we talked about it, I wouldn't necessarily know. I have never been aware of having mistaken the dead for the living. I'm not going to say it's never happened, but I don't actually recall an instance when that was the truth. So Monday morning, I got up to drive to work. It was early, early morning because it has to be for my commute, and it was not unexpected that I was ahead of some of the school buses. So I pull up to the major intersection that leads out of my neighborhood, and I see some kids waiting for the school bus there. And on the other side of the street, there were a couple of women standing there with their hands clasped in front of them, wearing like aprons and dark stockings and one of them was short and had dark hair one of them was tall and had light hair and I did my normal pull up to a stop and look both ways because I'm a cautious driver I'm more than a careful driver I am probably an overly cautious driver so I always come to a complete stop and go left right left probably another right left after it before I turn just to make sure especially when there's children waiting for a school bus on the street corner so I think to myself, as I'm stopping and glancing, that those ladies sure are dressed weird to have those strange aprons and dark stockings and dresses on. And it's weird because they're not actually standing with children. They're standing across the street looking at the children. But for some reason, I knew that they were watching over the kids. So as it hits me what exactly they're wearing, I was like, oh, well, maybe it's costume day at school. And when I look back, they were entirely gone. Like, just as if they had never been. There was not a tree or a mailbox or a bush there that could have explained what I saw. And it wasn't just a glance. Like, I paused to look at them for a second, thinking it was odd, looked to make sure no traffic was coming. And when I looked back, they were no longer there. But of course, it was ten times quicker than the story that I'm telling you, because it was all in a matter of seconds, and it takes much longer to retell. So there was no way that they could have walked back into the house and I would not have seen them still walking back into the house. The kids didn't seem to notice anything. I realized they were wearing basically turn of the century, like late 1890s, early 1900s attire, both with how their hair was and all of the other details. And I was like, okay, so it's uh, seven in the morning on a Monday and that's just how my week's going to start. Cool. My actual story for you this week has a similar tone to it in that I've had a few before, but I'm not overly familiar with clairaudient experiences. The most, the most memorable of which 
terrified the living daylights out of me. I was at a friend's house, and she lives out in the sticks. Their tiny little township doesn't, I think, even have a post office anymore, and it is in the hills of northwest Georgia. Uh, for those who may be familiar, it is the Aragon area that is between basically Rome and Rotmart. And they have a couple graveyards, a Dollar General, and a flea market, and that's about it. Really nice gas station. It's not really nice. I just really like the people who run it, and they always have everything that I want in stock, so I find it to be very nice. However, this house has been in her family for generations upon generations, and while she and her husband were waiting on their new house to be built out near her dad's, which was not that terribly far away, maybe two miles, they were living at what she always referred to as her mama's house. And I like mama's house because mama's house had a tin roof, and a sun porch that was screened in so even if there was inclement weather you could go outside and chill ostensibly outside in the screened in porch and listen to the rain on the tin roof and i was a ginormous fan of doing that i never had a tin roof growing up and i particularly got attached to this porch out to the side and the back was where the garden area was there were flowers that my friend tended there were flowers left over i think from you know family members past there was once an old shed out back, and there were pear trees, and a bunch of different stuff, as well as my friend's dogs, the brown dog and the buckets, as we lovingly called them. So it wasn't odd to be outside and hear noises. Uh, there were also some giant ravens that we nicknamed Hugin and Munin. There were squirrels the size of cats, because they were fed really well on the pear trees. Occasionally there were cats. And there was, of course, the dogs back there, plus various other wildlife. And the story I'm telling you now is not the only paranormal experience I ever had over there either. There was plenty of stuff in those woods, but it never really came onto the property or into the clearing unless it was a squirrel grabbing a pear or a raven just letting you know it was there. So I was not uncomfortable going outside after dark. I was, in fact, fine with it especially on the porch because there were lights you could see like 15 feet from the house as long as the lights were on so even if somebody did decide to walk up which was probably going to be the neighbor because they were the only people who were ever out there then you had plenty of time to get into the house and claim oh i don't live here but that never actually happened um i was friends with one of their dogs because one of their dogs would get out and come over and then i would just wait until she was done with me and go home <laughs> but I was sitting outside and having a cigarette, and it was getting cold. I remember that it was getting cold, but it was also sort of lightly raining. And despite the very, very light rain and some light wind, it was a mostly clear and quiet night, which was nice. So I sat down and lit a cigarette, and I was on my cell phone like I normally was. And I hear out behind me, closer to where the dogs were, I hear... Like a little whistled tune. That was not exactly it. I just remember that it was sort of like somebody whistling to themselves. And so I turn around and call to my friend's husband, assuming that he is out there to feed the dogs. No response. I was like, okay, that's weird. I very clearly just heard somebody whistle behind me. And the panic happens. Now, this is not the panic of, oh no, some dead spirit must be whistling behind me. No, this was the panic of, oh shit, there's someone on the property, it's dark, I can't see them, and I'm out here alone. So I went tearing inside. And I came in, and they were both like, oh, well, what's wrong? Because obviously, I was not just jauntily coming in, and I'd only been out there like a minute and a half at most. And so I told them, I was like, hey, we should probably turn on the lights, go check around the house, because I heard somebody whistling outside. Well, my friend's husband, of course, who who's also a friend of mine. I'm just trying to avoid using names right now. But every time I say it, it's like, oh, my friend's husband is like, no, he's my friend too. You know who you are. My friend's husband was like, okay, well, let me go put on my boots and we'll, we'll go check around, so on and so forth. But my friend was looking at me with this, mm, what did it sound like? She did ask me. She asked me what it sounded like and I just, you know, it mimicked the best I could. And she was like, mm, okay, I don't think anybody's out there, but it's better to be safe than sorry. So I went out there. My friend's husband and I were looking around. I told him where I heard it. Flashlights all around. We did the perimeter of the house, did the perimeter of like the mode part of 
the lawn because it then went into woods. And of course, there was nobody. There was no footprints that we could see. The ground was soft. Not like we're, you know, super sleuth investigators, but it would be pretty obvious when somebody had just recently walked out there. I relit my cigarette. My friend's husband took the opportunity to feed the animals. And by the time he was done with that, I had finished my cigarette and went back inside. So we hung out for a few more hours and I decided to go ahead and try and go back out there. So of course I sit down, light up another cigarette and I don't hear anything. And I'm like, okay, well, then I hear this, hmm, like this disapproving old lady and I turn and I get this impression. And this is how I normally interpret the dead. I get this impression of this old lady standing out by the pear tree in her bathrobe with crossed arms, just like shaking her head at something behind me. Now my back was again to closer to the dog pen and the majority of the lawn. I didn't think anything of it. I was like, okay, so there's an old lady in a pink bathrobe shaking her head at somebody that's not me. And then again, I hear Like this really thin sort of like somebody whistling to themselves. And I feel the ice go up my spine. It's no longer anxiety. I realize that there's somebody there. And I'm being fucked with. The only real impression that I got was denim. Like he was wearing like a denim pants and a denim shirt. And I was like, you know what? I don't appreciate this. I'm going to do one better than I can normally do for you folks. I'm going to go find out who you are. So I finished most of my cigarette, marched back inside, walked directly up to my friend who had given me the look earlier. And I know that she is very in touch with her family, both present and past, and that house and the entire land surrounding. And I looked her dead in the eye and said, okay, there's an old lady in a pink bathrobe and a guy in denim who's whistling at me. Who are these people? And she asked me to describe them. And the elderly lady was very clear. And she smiled at me and got a little misty eyed. And she said, that's my mama. That's Miss Virginia. And I apparently described her to a T. And then I asked about the guy because I was like, she, Miss Virginia, which she, she was henceforth ever known. I speak about her in conversation from time to time. And it is Miss Virginia. I was like, she was standing there under the pear tree, shaking her head at him. Like she couldn't believe what he was he was up to and that's when I heard the whistling again and she smiled and said that was her papa Henry apparently the jeans and the whistling and the fact that Miss Virginia was shaking her head at him was enough for her to know who that was she also said that he apparently uh, whistled often when he was outside so apparently that made sense and I just happened to hear it and then apparently the second time he decided to make me hear it as it were so Miss Virginia was her great-grandmother and lived at the house and Papa Henry also lived at the house, and they both passed on at that house. So it made a whole heck of a lot of sense to my friend that they were both still sort of lingering around a bit, though it was apparently a bit shocking that Miss Virginia was out of the house in her bathrobe. That was not standard Miss Virginia procedure. But I guess when you have passed on, you may not care anymore, and you want to be comfortable, or you don't really have a choice in what you're wearing, and it's just uh, what you last had on or something of that sort. Good news was neither of them still seemed to be in their death state, and they were just up keeping the property as they saw fit. So that is my spooky paranormal experience story for you this week, and I hope you enjoyed it. I have not been to that house in a while, but if I do end up going back, since uh, my friends now have their own house that they've moved into, if I do end up going back and having an update on Miss Virginia and Paw Henry, I will let you all know. So our listener story today actually comes from a friend of mine who I was talking to over chat. So the first part of it sort of comes in in the middle, but the first part of the chat wasn't entirely relevant. However, I really liked both like a little snippet and then the story that he told me, and I asked if it was cool if I used it on the podcast. He said, yes, here we are. So our listener story today comes from Ron, and Ron writes, Do you know what a water spout is? A water spout is a tornado out at sea. The sisters is what you call two or more when they form. I saw the sisters when I was a kid from about 500 yards. I have never been so certain I was going to die in my entire life, not even the two times I did fucking die. True story, by the way. My buddy Ron has died twice and lived to tell about it. Legally dead. Flatline. 
He continues, not a funny story, though. Horrifying, and there are parts of it I just can't remember. But we were between two spouts, and my dad said there was a third one, but I don't remember seeing that one. I don't think I've ever written my creepy stories out before, or even really told much of them because it's always seemed like a thing that people would just judge me over. That is fair, sir. This is a safe space. This will always be a safe space, and I am happy to share your creepy stories. Seeing the sisters and being between the two funnels is terrifying. Not paranormal. Actually completely and utterly natural, and still terrifying. Ron's actual story for us today, I love so strap in you guys i heard and saw a specter once down in savannah at the fort as a reenactor i've laid awake at night listening to thousands of marching feet in camden south carolina at the house on horseshoe park it's just a thing we deal with you camp out on a battlefield you're sleeping on blood-soaked soil you're gonna get weird feelings that is fair and accurate Savannah is ripped up with Revolutionary War history, and the spooks are everywhere out there. I had gotten up early to watch the sun rise over the marshes east of the park, and I was pretty sure it'd rise right in the middle of a channel between the two islands. They have this swing there, like an old-fashioned porch swing, and I was relaxing in my gear, drinking coffee and enjoying the quiet of the morning. Listening to the swamp wake up, the things that bump, chirp, and roar at night were laying down for the day, and the things that live in the light were moving around. Another reenactor came up and was standing next to me, just being quiet, like you do at times like that. It was cold out, colder than it should have been, I think, but at the time I had figured it was the breeze coming off the water. I looked at the guy, young, fit-ish, probably early twenties. I didn't recognize him, and having just started drinking coffee, I wasn't feeling chatty. About the time the sun came up, I realized that the light was going through him. And he said, it's been a long watch. And I said the only thing that I could think of in the moment, sun's up, the watch is over. And just like that, he was gone. Oh, wow. There's more. I need a moment. Okay. I have never been back to that park in Savannah, though. I do wonder if the bench was put there just for that young man to have company on occasion, and I hope he heard what he was waiting for. Three hundred years is a long time to wait for peace. He just winked out of sight. I have no doubt as to what I saw there on that bench, besides the redoubt, when you go back and question after the fact. I don't remember what the moon was like. I don't remember much other than it being February and cold as shit in Savannah that morning. And I don't know why, but it's never struck me as scary, weird, or creepy. That particular encounter has only ever made me feel a bit melancholy and oddly peaceful. That is one hell of a story, fam. I don't have words, honestly. The somberness of the moment. It's like I can see it. I can feel it. I can picture it so very clearly in my head. First of all, that's crazy. The fact that he was so tangible, so real, and it wasn't until the like the sun hit him that you realized the sun was going through him, that it was a it wasn't just a person standing there. The fact that you could describe that he was somewhere in his twenties, mostly fit, that's just crazy. I've it makes makes my heart hurt a little bit that someone so young would possibly be wandering around down there for so long. I hope he did find peace. Maybe that's uh maybe that's why he disappeared rather than just like him repeating the same pattern every night. I think the real impressive thing here is the fact that you managed to potentially lay a spirit to rest with like the perfect thing to say all before you'd finished your morning coffee. I don't know as I could do that, sir. I really don't. I need that morning coffee. And you're sitting here going, okay, this is a nice sunrise. I'm going to have my coffee. Okay, somebody's standing here. I'm not sure if I want to interact with this. Okay. He's see-through. Cool. Long watch, huh, kid? Well, guess what? Sun is up. Watch is over. Yeah, no, that was very eloquently said, sir. Efficiently handled. I appreciate you. The fact that it was all done amidst the morning cup of coffee, before that morning coffee was complete? I'm thrice as impressed. Well played to you, sir. 
and I commend you. Thank you for sharing this story. This is a beautiful story, honestly. And as a reenactor, I would be interested to hear other battlefield stories and anything creepy that you would like to send in. And yes, I know you said this particular one always made you sort of feel melancholy rather than weird or creepy. I don't think it's weird. You were on a battlefield. You were reenacting. Creepy? Not this one particularly. However, I'm sure you have a couple of good ones that you may not initially think of as creepy because as a reenactor, you're like, okay, some weird shit's probably going to happen. That's just how it goes. But I can promise you that there is probably a large portion of our audience that would absolutely think it was creepy. And I would 1000% love for you to share with us because I know there have got to be some real interesting and just, I don't know, I find, I find things like that to be gripping. Like I will read voraciously stories of like battlefield reenactment hauntings and things like that. So if you have any more of those, please, please, please write them up. Please send them to me. I don't even care if you send them in Messenger. You can send them to the email address, but just like get them to me. I want to not only read them on the podcast, but I just want to read them for myself. Thank you, Ron, for sharing your stories. And I very much appreciate you, sir. And that is our listener story for this episode. And that brings us uh, to the end of episode six, guys, which is crazy. I'm super excited that we are six eps into this. And a couple of more will be at like two months. That's crazy. I want to thank everybody for all of your all of your support. All of the information and feedback that I've gotten from you guys has been super helpful, super positive. I'm really glad that you guys are enjoying this. As my sort of witchy tip for the day, since we covered some big stuff last week, I wanted to encourage everyone just to take a moment. And since we are approaching a very busy, very stressful, very hectic season in which we are expected to equally at the same time be gracious and appreciative of those things around us, I want to encourage everybody to make sure that you have some me time. Mental and emotional health is very important to me personally, and I think should be important to everyone. And I know that we each have our own ways of dealing with it sometimes. But when you're trying to get the Christmas presents and the Thanksgiving shopping done and make it to all four families that you have to get to for each holiday and potentially dealing with caustic members of the family that you have to put up with in order to see the ones that you really want to see, or even if you are completely fine with your entire family, it's still a stressful time of year, driving, shopping at all. Like we all still have to have groceries. It may not be Thanksgiving groceries. You may have you may have all of your present shopping done and did in July, like my grandmother used to. I'm not kidding. But everyone else around you is stressed. So even when you're going through your everyday life and routine, Everyone else around you is stressed, and that rubs. That that can have an effect on us as people, as social creatures who work in a pack kind of deal. So I want to encourage you to do one thing, at least today, at some point when you have it, or tomorrow, and maybe try and do it once a day, where you step into your bedroom, or you step into a side room, like an empty meeting room at work, or, my personal favorite, you take a step outside. And you close your eyes and you take a deep breath in and you do nothing but feel the air around you and you feel the ground beneath your feet and you feel your own body and you make yourself aware of your own body and you hear your heartbeat. And once everything in your mind quiets down, I want you to think about something that you are looking forward to for the new year or the holidays, seeing your grandmother. Seeing your mama, seeing your papa, seeing your brother's kids, seeing your sister who you're really good friends with and haven't seen in a while, or what you're looking forward to about 2020. And I just want you to pause and take a moment and in the quiet of your mind, hold that one thought in the palm of your hand and focus on it and focus on how that clear, pure anticipation feels that makes you happy, and how you know those things, those goals, are going to make you happy. And remind yourself that even when it gets super stressful and super hectic, and somebody cuts you off at the mall, and somebody tries to jump in line ahead of you, it's okay. Because it's all leading up to that moment. It's all headed for that anticipation. 
And it is okay to forgive that person who cut you off. And it's okay to forgive the person who jumped in front of you in line because they're obviously having a worse time of it than you. And you are headed for that thing that is going to make you happy. And hopefully, in those moments, when you take that time before you go back to your daily routine of work, life, family, etc., those moments of peace, those moments of focusing on the thing that you're looking forward to, and taking that time for yourself to clear your mind, to let go of the stress for just a minute and think about something that makes you happy, something that you're looking forward to, those little touchstones will help you get through this holiday season without any type of horrible stress happening. Help ease the tension and help you get through with a better mindset and a smile on your face and a better outlook towards what is coming towards us at the end and the beginning of this year. Well, the end of this year and the beginning of next year. So that's my advice to you this week, self-care, because in self-care, there is power. There is a certain power to being the person who is honestly in the best control and not stressed and the least anxious in a room. Because that means that not only are you not stressed, but you can help people put out little fires. You can help through making yourself a priority and your emotional and mental state a priority. You can help others achieve a similar type of calm and maybe make somebody's day a little bit brighter. Maybe prevent some sort of tiny calamity to do with the holiday season for someone else. It's coming. Turkey Day's around the corner. I'd be interested to know on social media if you guys have any uh, any plans, if you're planning any witchy things, if you're planning any paranormal things, or if you just have fun time plans you'd like to share. Please feel free to hit me up on my Instagram at that spooky life podcast. Also, I always need listener stories. I always love reading listener stories. Even if I one day get to the point where I have way too many listener stories to ever conceivably fit into a podcast ever, I am still going to go through and read every single one of them because that's one of the reasons I started this podcast. It's the thing that I love. I like hearing about other people's experiences in both the paranormal or witchy things, etc. And I would love for you guys to share with me anything that you would like me to read, anything that you would like me to share with the podcast audience, or you can even just be like, hey, this one's for you. I would love to read anything you guys would like to send me. And if you want it read on the podcast, you can send it to that spooky life podcast at gmail.com. I am always accepting them there. Um, like this one I pulled from Messenger and then just asked for permission from the person I was talking to, my buddy Ron. If there's something that you're not sure and you want to get in touch with me, go ahead and fire off an email or hit me up in Messenger. Be like, hey, I'm not sure this is what you're looking for. Nine times out of 10. In fact, I would even go far as to say 9.5 times out of 10. I'm going to say, Yes, that is exactly the type of thing that I want. That is the exact type of thing I would like to share because I love all of this and I love that you guys are loving it. So please keep suggestions and stories coming. I want to thank each and every one of you guys out there for listening. You guys are the best. Every time I see that there are like, I have like 27 plays on one of my episodes right now. That's insane to me. This is wonderful. I appreciate every single one of you individually. You are all amazing, and I am super grateful that you're here and enjoying what we're doing. So, for right now, I am going to end the episode with this high positive note of you You guys are awesome. Please continue to be awesome, and I will talk to you guys next week. Until then, stay spooky, guys. Bye.